we're going to, as I indicated, uh, we covered, uh, and, and some of the ones that I was going to cover in lecture we covered in lab, so I'm not going to cover the cockroaches again. I think we adequately covered those. But I do want to cover today uh, a little bit more about the, the fleas and bed bugs. Uh, these are very common things that people get in their homes, and I think we need a, a little more information on, on how to deal with those. Uh, also in the flies, you'll notice that here in lecture I'm going to add a few additional flies uh, to our collection that we talked about. Uh, we have the we talked in lab about the larger flies, the house fly, the uh, carrion flies or blow flies, and and we didn't talk about the flesh flies. Those sound pretty nasty, but the reality is is that most of the flesh flies that I see around our landscapes, even though the the name would indicate that they may feed on carrion or things like that, uh, most of the flesh flies are actually parasites of other insects. And when you see them, uh, what it's indicating is that you might have a caterpillar infestation in your tree or shrub or something like that, and, and these uh, parasitic flies are, are going after them. We didn't talk about the, the what we call the small fruit flies or the Drosophila. Uh, technically, entomologists call those vinegar flies. Uh, to us, fruit flies are a different group of flies that actually get into uh, things like tree fruits. Uh, then there's some other nuisance flies that, that we also uh, need to, to cover. Remember that all flies have that uh, complete life cycle, and the flies that we're talking about are considered to be the upper group of flies, and so they have that uh, more traditional uh, life cycle that we're familiar with the flies. That means that they, they lay eggs, uh, they will have three larval instars, the larvae are true maggots, you see no head capsule, actually there's no evidence of a head at all, if you look at the uh, pointed tapered end of that, that's where the head part is, or the mouth, and about all that's there is, uh, of course, the brain, that would be in, uh, in that part, uh, but the mandibles have been reduced down to these little uh, pair of hooks, uh, and, and so these maggots actually rasp the surface of their foods, uh, and they have to take in liquids uh, that, that they uh, rasp. You also notice that you don't see any spiracles uh, in most of the segments of the body, and a true maggot only has a pair of anterior spiracles, uh, which would be in the, the prothoracic region, and then they have a pair of posterior spiracles at the very tip of the abdomen. Then they have a pair of very long tracheal trunks that, that uh, join that uh, anterior spiracles to the posterior spiracles, and then there are other tracheal trunks that break off of that to service the rest of the body. So kind of a different body arrangement than, than we're familiar with with most insect larvae. Also remember that this group of flies pupate inside of the last larval exoskeleton. Uh, that less larval exoskeleton is thickened and hardened into a structure that we call the puparium. And so the, the true pupa the, that you could see where the eyes are developing, the wings are developing, the legs are developing, are actually on the inside of, of that capsule looking structure, uh, which is the puparium. <clears throat> In lecture, we saw the, uh, these flies, the house fly and, and the uh, uh, blow flies, but I didn't really talk that much about the Drosophila or what you probably call fruit flies, but uh, we, we would technically call the uh, vinegar flies. Now, why would we call these vinegar flies? Where does vinegar come from? Do you even know? <laughs> wow. How far we've gotten away from, from things. Um, those people that are wine connoisseurs, the worst thing that can happen to them is they, they've uh, stored this really high-priced wine uh, down in their, their basement, their storage unit, and they bring it out and they uncork it and go, ah, oh, it's turned to vinegar. So what vinegar is is actually alcohol that, that has been, again, converted by a bacterium uh, into acetic acid. And, and so vinegar is made uh, from alcohol, and, and it's from basically spoiling alcohol uh, in order to make that uh, acetic acid. Now, why are these flies attracted to that? Uh, 
most of these, uh, what we call the lesser uh, fruit flies or the vinegar flies, are attracted to yeast odors. And that's why they come to your overripe fruit that you might have sitting in the kitchen or the dining room is that uh, the uh, uh, material that the yeast that are producing uh, the alcohol of those are, are generally on the outside of the fruits. They'll be using the sugar that are in those fruits to convert those into alcohol, but in the meantime they also produce these yeasty odors. And uh, So uh, uh, people that, that make bread, uh, make beer, wine, things like that are very familiar with uh, the, these vinegar flies because they're attracted to those yeasty odors uh, in anticipation that the alcohol that's made from that will eventually be converted into uh, uh, acetic acid or vinegar. As I indicated to you before, uh, they, these are very small. They're usually only a, a couple of millimeters in, in length, uh, usually in the kitchen area. And I'm always amazed. Uh, uh, you can have no fruit flies around whatsoever, but you go out on your deck, open up a, a, a bottle of beer or a, a bottle of wine, and within minutes, you'll have one of these little uh, uh, fruit flies uh, coming in. They're, they're really good at detecting fermenting odors uh, from a long period of uh, uh, distance away. Uh, there are real nuisance in restaurants. There's nothing worse than going to a very expensive restaurant where you're paying, let's say, 50 to $100 a, a plate, and they open up the wine, and all of a sudden there's this little fly uh, dancing around your, your table. Uh, and I work with a lot of uh, restaurant tours uh, on how to get rid of these. And the biggest problem is that they're generally not cleaning up the kitchen. Uh, of all of the plant residue and, and fruit juices and things like that. And more importantly, they're often not disposing of their waste materials far enough away. Uh, the dumpster may be right outside the back door uh, of that restaurant, and, and it really needs to be at the end of the block. Uh, and, uh, or uh, they have to contract with a, a dumpster servicing company that will empty that dumpster maybe uh, three times a week rather than once or twice a week and uh, they need to clean that dumpster out because the dumpster bottom can often have uh, all the, the fermenting organic debris that these things uh, love to breed in. Another one that uh, we're seeing a, a real increase in is one that looks a lot like the fruit fly. It's, it's about the same size but they're really called scuttleflies. Uh, now, they're in the, the family Foridae, and so entomologists talk about them as, as being forward flies, but that doesn't mean anything to, to most people. But when I mention scuttlefly and, and mention their behavior, while the fruit fly will typically go and land and, and sort of slowly walk around, and then if you get close to it, it go and flying off, these things uh, uh, land on a surface and they go zip, zip, zip. They scuttle real fast and fly real fast. They're, they're a very different temperament, uh, moving very, very rapidly around and, uh, scoot, as I say, sort of scooting on surfaces. Uh, and uh, Some people say that they, they look like they're kind of dancing around on, on the surfaces and so forth. <clears throat> Uh, the bad part of this one is, is that the fly larvae uh, prefer rancid fats and oils. And again, this is a very common one that we find in restaurants. Uh, most uh, people who have not been in the restaurant industry uh, realizes that restaurants have what is called a, a grease trap. Uh, that, that's associated with the uh, kitchen and basically what it is is a system where all fats and oils that may go down the drain get separated in that drain and go into a pit uh, which is usually just outside uh, the back door and quite often maybe once a month or twice a month that pit has to actually be cleaned out. There's a, 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 a truck that will come by and, and suck up all those fats and oils and, and remove them uh, out of there. Well if, if 
that grease trap uh, isn't uh, uh, cleaned out on a regular basis and, and properly maintained, uh, these four flies or scuttle flies can get established in there uh, and, and wreak havoc uh, inside both the kitchen area and, and also in the, in the servicing area. These things also occasionally, uh, I've, I've had a, at least three hospitals that have ended up with these uh, and, and in all three cases what was happening is that the uh, sewer pipe that was coming out of the kitchen area had somehow gotten broken. Uh, and, and the fats and oils and, and waste material that was going down that was infusing the soils uh, un underneath the building uh, and these flies had discovered those and again uh, you don't want these flies in a, in a hospital uh, because again they're going to be uh, moving around on contaminated surfaces they're going to be picking up bacteria and fungal spores and things like that you don't want these scooting around on, uh, especially in the operating room uh, or, or uh, on patients that uh, are supposed to have sterile dressings and, and so forth. We've already talked about the drain fly, and I won't mention that much more other than, again, uh, this is one in, in which the larvae feeds on the uh, bacterial and algal scum that's, that's inside the, the uh, pipes. What did I say was the best way to control these? Just want to see if you remember what we did in the lab. Pardon? Yeah, we need an enzyme cleaner uh, on this. You, you can try to throw uh, bleach down there. You can try to put Drano down the drain. Uh, the, the larvae of these are extremely adept uh, at avoiding them. They have a very thick exoskeleton, and, and that uh, those materials don't seem to bother them all that much. So you really need one of these enzyme cleaners to remove that bacteria and the algal scum. Uh, in, in areas, uh, especially like restaurants and bars, that, that might get these in, in large numbers. Uh, I recommend a, probably a monthly cleaning uh, with one of those enzyme cleaners in order to keep these down. Otherwise, most of our facilities here, uh, I know some of the, the maintenance people uh, treat our uh, many of our uh, restrooms and buildings uh, once or twice a year is about all that they use them. We also talked about the cluster fly. Uh, cluster flies are our primary fall invaders, uh, and their presence means that you have good soil and uh, good earthworm populations nearby. We didn't talk about the fungus gnats, uh, and this used to be almost strictly a pest that we find associated with greenhouses and, and other plant growing areas, but more recently they become more and more common household pests. And I can blame it almost uh, uh, completely on uh, mulch. Uh, we're seeing too much mulch being used outside. Especially mulch with an irrigation system means that you're going to have a lot of fungi growing and feeding on that decaying mulch. Uh, that means you're going to get these uh, the fly larvae feeding on that fungus, just as the, the name implies, and then they're going to come inside the, the house. Uh, these uh, have, uh, they're fairly small flies, only about uh, two to three millimeters in length, usually black or dark brown in color, have extremely long legs, and, and they tend to, to sort of dance and flit around uh, on surfaces. I really wouldn't consider them to be a filth insect because uh, uh, we've not really associated them uh, with uh, getting in, in those kinds of, of areas, but the larvae can uh, breed in, in very large numbers wherever you have have rotting plant material or plant material that's got molds and fungi growing on it. Now let's move into some of the other nuisance pests, uh, and in this particular case, uh, these are, are ones that we wouldn't generally consider uh, filth pests, but more in the nuisance category. And, and uh, I always have to smile uh, when, when we uh, uh, talk about these, because it's amazing the number of people that call in. Uh, actually, this fall, for some reason, was a big year for some of the, the wolf spiders and funnel web spiders getting into people's homes. And, and I had dozens of emails and quite a few phone calls about how do I keep these spiders from getting into my house? Well, I'll ask you. How would you keep spiders from getting in your house? How are they getting in there? Pardon? 
You've got cracks and cracks. You've got holes in your house. <laughs> and, and the most common crack or crevice is, is the door seals. Uh, most people don't know how to maintain the door seals, especially modern doors. Uh, can be pretty complicated. They, they can have a base plate down underneath the door that can be raised and lowered. Many of those base plates also have rubber seals in them that periodically, usually every three or four years, that rubber seal has to be replaced. Uh, it, it can can get broken. Uh, it can get hardened, and it, it doesn't. It's not flexible anymore to do the seal. Likewise, on the underside of the door itself, maybe the counterparts to that. There may be specific specific seals and adjustments that can be done in order to raise and lower those and, and make sure that you've got good seals on those. Uh, but again, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing the number of general homeowners that are unaware of what they can or cannot do with their doors. Yes? No, they, these are full-grown adults, and, and that would indicate to me, but even a full-grown adult spider, a quarter of an inch gap is, is plenty big enough for them to squeeze through that. Uh, they, they don't mind uh, moving through there. But even an eighth of an inch gap would allow things like an earwig uh, to get in through there, uh, or and definitely spiders, I mean ants. When we come to the ants, uh, holy moly. Uh, no, I don't expect you to know all these ant species. Uh, that, that I would have to probably look half of them up myself uh, in here, but I wanted you to be aware that there's a tremendous number of ants that live in our landscapes, in and around our homes, and many of these, uh, especially the ones that are highlighted there at the top, can actually have their colonies inside of our buildings. <coughs> And that would include the odors house ant, pavement ants, field ants, pharaoh ants, and the carpenter ants. Uh, some of these other ones uh, uh, can also build in, in the house. The acrobat ants, uh, the little black ant, thief ant, are also ones that can have their entire colony in little voids uh, of the building. Now, with that said, generally the pavement ant is going to have its colony in the soil, but it will very commonly come into the building. It will uh, uh, forage uh, for basically it, it's looking for sweets, fats, and oils, which obviously typically occur in our kitchen area. Carpenter ants, on the other hand, uh, often build nests in the voids that we have in and around the, the buildings. Uh, and usually when we have a carpenter ant infestation in the building itself, it usually means that we've got a moisture problem. It's usually we've got some siding that has broken or cracked and is allowing moisture uh, to get underneath it, or we've got a failure of the roof uh, or the, the uh, roof seals and things like that, and moisture is coming in uh, on, on the wooden structures from that. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of ants, uh, and we won't go that much into ant morphology, but uh, there's all these websites out there that, that will allow you to identify most of those uh, common ants. The reality is, is ant identification is done uh, primarily by, first, how many nodes it has. And what do we mean by the nodes? Well, remember that the, and for most of the hymenoptera, the thorax is joined to the abdomen by a little construction. A, a narrow waist, but in the case of ants, there can be what looks like a, a little leaf-like structure or a little bump there or two bumps. Those bumps are called nodes, and, and they're on the pedestal part, the little skinny part uh, of the abdomen. And so when we look at the, them, uh, the first thing that we do is that a, a one-node ant or a two-node ant, then we can also look at the, the shape of the antennae, the shape of the head. Uh, and the, uh, whether the thorax is, is smooth, whether it has some bumps on it or spines on it. And then the, some of the final things is uh, at the tip of the abdomen, we see two groups of ants. Uh, one group of ants have the, this little ring of hairs around the tip of their anus, and the other groups of ants don't have that. Just to show you how that can work, uh, most people wouldn't recognize the difference in their kitchen of a black carpenter ant. Uh, it's just a fairly good-sized big black ant 
or a black field ant, which is also uh, generally a, a fairly large black ant. Both of these could occur inside of the kitchen area. But to the entomologist, uh, we would notice that, number one, they're both single node ants. You can see there's only one bump there between the, the uh, thorax and the abdomen. But if we take a look at the thorax itself, Notice that the black carpenter ant has a entirely smooth top, uh, so it, it makes a, a nice curve around the top. But the black field ant and, and all the rest of the formica, the genus formica, uh, have this definite bump. There's a, a little bump that, that's uh, between the mesothorax and the metathorax, and, and so that's how we would actually identify those. Uh, uh, if, if some of them were sent to me and some alcohol said, which ant is that, I'd be looking, is it a smooth thorax or does it have a bump? As I indicated to you before, uh, there are two node ants, and, and some of our most common two node ants are the pavement ant. We've already talked about the pavement ant having fights out in your yard, but uh, the pavement ants can come inside. Frankly, the pavement ant is, is probably our most common nuisance ant that we find in schools, uh, and that's primarily because most schools have a lot of sidewalks around them, a lot of pavement areas, uh, and, and the uh, buildings often aren't well maintained. There can get to be little cracks or crevices in the foundation uh, or into the uh, 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 brick wall work itself, and those can allow for the ants to come inside. In the case of the acrobat ants, again, it's a two-node ant, but the difference here is that the pavement ant has only one, uh, uh, you know, pair of uh, spines on the back of it, and, and the acrobat uh, has actually got two spines on the back of the thorax. The other difference is, is that the acrobat ant is called an acrobat ant because it has, you know, in looking down top-wise, it has a heart-shaped abdomen, and they're called acrobat ants is that when they walk around, they tend to sort of wave their abdomen around uh, with them, and, and uh, people thought it was uh, they were doing some acrobatic moves. Again, we generally, uh, you know, one of the first things that I look at in an ant is does it have the one node or the two nodes, and then I go from there to help me identify them. Now remember, uh, just a, sort of as a reminder, that uh, and when you buy a home or a, a house, uh, there's going to be what we call a termite inspection for that. It's actually a wood-destroying insect uh, inspection. Uh, and then it should include both uh, carpenter ants and termites uh, in there, but most people are just thinking termites rather than carpenter ants. The reason why I wanted to put this one back in here is remember that uh, both ants and termites swarm. Ants generally swarm, that means release winged reproductives during the late spring, summer, into the early fall. Termites, on the other hand, are subterranean termites, only release their swarmers in the springtime. <coughs> now, if you get the swarmers emerging inside of the house, uh, if you can capture them, uh, the first thing you want to find out, do they have elbowed antennae? or do they have beaded or straight antennae? And more importantly, do they have a narrow constricted waist where those little nodes would be, or is the waist broadly joined to the abdomen? And, and that would let us know, are you dealing with termites or are you dealing with ants? And of course, the, the management of those are, are very different. Also, the cost of management is going to be very different. Uh, we'll talk next uh, week about the, the wood-destroying insects, uh, and we will we'll get into greater detail about the termites. Another big feature to me is that when termite swarmers emerge, many of the swarmers immediately will drop their wings. And so quite often where the swarming event was occurring, there will be a, a little uh, scattering of wings in there. Ants, on the other hand, have to take flight, and both the male and the drone mate during that uh, nuptial flight. And, and so they're not going to drop their wings where they emerge. They need their wings in order to fly, in order to mate. When it comes to ant management, uh, this has changed dramatically, uh, and I get very upset. Uh, people call me and, and say, uh, you know, Dr. Scheller, I'm, I think I need a pest control company, and, and I've contacted uh, this pest control company, and the first thing they want to do is they want me to, to go on a monthly treatment program. And I say, no. 
<laughs> Just, uh, you do not need a monthly treatment for insects in and around your home. It's, uh, it, it, it probably means that you're exposing yourself to more pesticides than need be. And number two, the company doesn't want to do the real job. And the real job in integrated pest management, remember, is monitoring, determining what pest is there, and taking appropriate action for that pest. They're just trying to do a, a general, what they consider to be a preventive action, and usually the preventive actions that they take are, are largely ineffective, and so when you really do have a pest problem, you'll have to call them back anyway and have them come out and, and do a service call and really uh, deal with that. So I answer the same thing. Uh, first, we'd want to know what species we're, we're dealing with. We'd want to then know, is this a species that can nest in the building and cavities, or is it a species like the, the pavement ant that might be nesting actually in the ground, but coming in through cracks and crevices of the building uh, to get in there. Typically, uh, ants now, instead of using what we consider to be uh, contact poisons, uh, these were the, the crack and crevice baseboard treatments that uh, were common back in the, the uh, 50s up through the, the 70s and 80s. And basically, that just means a guy comes in, or a lady now, uh, with a hand can sprayer and just sprays an insecticide ban around every one of your rooms, uh, the cracks and crevices, and places like that. Uh, we know those are largely ineffective. Uh, all they do is uh, if the ant comes into contact with that, it goes, oop, uh, I'll go away. And, and uh, so it never really crosses the insecticide to get enough of it to kill them all. Our current technology for ant management is to use baits. Uh, what we do is we actually create special foods for and, and again you need special baits for each one of the ants because there are some ants that prefer sweet materials there are some ants that, that prefer protein materials there are some ants that prefer oils and fats uh, as their food and so depending on the ant uh, you would select the, the bait that has that kind of material in it most of these baits also are kind of interesting in that they have what we consider to be a slow toxicity material. Now what do I mean? Uh, actually probably a better word is a slow action material. What I really want in that bait is I want an insecticide that the foraging ants are going to pick up and most people are unaware of this in the, in the ant colonies the workers actually don't digest food. They collect food they take the food back to the nest and they feed that food to the ant larvae and the ant larvae have the, the microbes and, and the digestive enzymes in their gut. They're just the ones that can, re, that can digest that food and then they'll regurgitate or defecate some of the partially digested food and that's what actually the worker ants will feed on. So what I'm going to try to do with this bait is I want the worker ants, the foraging ants, to pick this bait up, take it back to the colony and feed it to the larvae. And many of these baits have insect growth regulator effects. So what's that going to do? Well, it's going to prohibit the ant larvae from developing, and they'll all die off. And, and so uh, the, it's really kind of a, a strange technique here. Now, there are other baits that, that are what we would consider to be slow-acting acute toxicants. In this particular case, what happens is that those are designed to kill the queen if we can get to her. And so what will happen is the worker ants will pick up these insecticides. They'll not be killed directly, but they'll give it to the larvae. Then when the other workers will pick up the larvae and feed it to the queen. And these insecticides, when the queen, you've got to remember, eats a lot more than any other ant in the colony, she'll eventually pick up a toxic dose and be killed. And if we've got an ant uh, species that only has one queen per colony, then the colony's gone. We've, we've done our job. Now, many of the ants that we've talked about have multiple queens, but again, the, the process is the same. If we can get enough of this bait into the system and kill all of those queens, we have now eliminated the colony, not just eliminated some foraging workers. 
Okay, moving into to spiders. Uh, again, most entomologists uh, consider spiders beneficial, uh, but the average public doesn't. Uh, they, they think they're yucky, they, they're ugly looking, and they've heard that indeed all spiders do have fangs, all spiders do have venom, but there's really only a very few number of spiders that have any type of venom that would be dangerous uh, to humans or pets or anything like that. <coughs> The most common spiders that I find around uh, many of our homes are little jumping spiders. Uh, these are very active predators uh, uh, that, that are around. Uh, probably our most common one is a little black jumping spider. It's called the, the daring jumper. Uh, and uh, these freak out people uh, because, uh, uh, number one, they don't make a web. They're always running around. But they have extremely good eyesight. Uh, and if they see you moving, they will often turn. And, and look at you. Uh, unfortunately, they're very nearsighted. And, and so in order to figure out whether you're a, a friend, meaning a, a, something to mate with, uh, or a foe, meaning uh, something that could damage them or prey, they've got to get close enough to see you. And, and typically, these little jumping spiders they'll, will sort, sort of turn around and, and kind of come at you and, and maybe do some little motions. But I guarantee, as soon as they realize how big you are, they're going to turn the other way and, and run and jump away. Wolf spiders are also kind of interesting, especially in, in summer and fall, in that mis many of the wolf spiders are active predators in our landscapes, our, our yards, gardens, and places like that. Uh, but occasionally they do, uh, when it gets hot and dry, they'll try to find a cool, moist place to hide, which means that they uh, enter into your garage or into the basement or someplace like that. In late summer or fall, uh, they can be especially troublesome to the average public because the females carry their egg case around with them. Remember, they don't make a nest or anything like that, but they carry the egg case around them. When the eggs hatch, the female keeps the babies on her back. And, and she'll usually keep at least the first two instars of her babies on her back. And she'll actually, when she captures prey, she'll rip the prey open and allow her little baby spiderlings to come down and, and feed. But eventually, uh, uh, when they get too heavy, she starts to flick them off and say, hey, go find your own food and, and go about your way. But you can imagine if one of these got into the home and, and the homeowner whaps it with the newspaper, and all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of little spiderlings running all over the place. It, uh, again, people kind of freak out from that. We've already talked earlier in the season, uh, the only two, quote, dangerous spiders that we have here in North America is the brown recluse and the black widow spider. Uh, we have both of them here in Ohio. We do have recluse spiders. They don't do well outside, but uh, we've been able to import some of the recluse spiders and, and they can live in buildings. Uh, I find them most commonly in office buildings and uh, in, uh, inner city buildings that are interconnected with underground tunnels and, and networks and things like that. Uh, very rarely do I find them in, in uh, independent residential uh, houses. Black widows are primarily south of I-70, uh, but uh, occasionally we do get a black widow in, in the uh, northern part of the, the state. Uh, the problem with the brown, the brown recluse is that we also have the Mediterranean recluse. It's another imported species that looks identical uh, to it. The Mediterranean recluse, fortunately, doesn't have a very potent necrotoxin and, and so uh, is uh, less dangerous than the true brown recluse. Some of the other spiders that we occasionally find, uh, one that, that's also a little troublesome to me that we're seeing more and more is the yellow sack spider. And, and there's a, a imported species that's called the agrarian yellow sack spider. It looks pretty much like our native one. Uh, but that one also apparently has a necrotoxin that is similar uh, to the brown recluse. And, and we're getting a few more cases uh, every year of people getting bit by this one. You've all seen that little sack spider. The reason why we call it a sack spider is that uh, during the daytime it tends to rest in what we call a little bivouac uh, webbing. And usually around the, the cracks or, or the, where the walls meet the ceilings, uh, the joints and things like that. You've all seen them. There are, sometimes can be, a, it looks like a, about a, an inch, inch and a quarter long piece of web 
it just is a little sheet web that runs from the, the ceiling to the wall. Uh, and that spider likes to hide in there during the daytime and then come out at nighttime, uh, creep around and, and look for insect prey. And, and of course, the problem with that, don't mean to give anybody nightmares, is that while you're sleeping is when this spider is out looking for th uh, things. And if it happens to get on the bed and, and crawl around on you and you roll over on it, uh, it's going to try to protect itself. And, and that means it might bite you. When it comes to spider management, uh, again, I always talk to people that there's got to be cracks and crevices, uh, poor seals on your doors and around your windows that it's allowing these spiders to get in. None of these spiders, except for the brown recluse, prefers to live inside of buildings. They're, they're generally outdoor spiders, but they will sometimes come in to try to find foods and things like that. Another thing that we're seeing in, in many of our urban areas is everybody wants night lights now. Uh, and and uh, I understand that. Uh, we, we think it's better security, uh, the walls and things like that. But uh, uh, what's going to come to those night lights? Other insects. And guess what spiders eat? They eat other insects. And, and so my feeling is a lot of what I'm seeing in, in terms of spiders in, around the homes uh, is there's too many night lights. And, and if, uh, if possible, if you can even get your night lights on those uh, uh, motion detector type of lights where they're off, but then if they detect motion, they go on for a short period of time, uh, that, that would be more ideal because they're not being on all the time. They're not going to get uh, moths and other insects coming in in there that the uh, spiders are going to try to feed on. Generally, uh, again, most of the, the pest control industry is still doing crack and crevice uh, applications for these. My feeling is, is is that when we were working with our school integrated pest management, uh, what we would do is when we remove these like these uh, plastic baseboard uh, flushings in there, there's a little crack or crevice under there. And what we would find is that during the maintenance, most schools about every three or four years will remove those to replace them because they get scuffed up and, and so forth. When you remove those, you can use a sealant to seal the crack that's underneath that. And then when you put them back, there's no cracks or crevices for the ants or spiders or any of these other things uh, uh, to come in. And finally, I do give you permission to crush them. Uh, you know, you, uh, use that uh, cultural mechanical control uh, is, is perfectly adequate for most spiders. When it comes to the earwigs, uh, again, we've talked about earwigs. Uh, um, earwigs are kind of misunderstood critters. They're ugly looking things to most people. They've got those pinchers on the end of them that look threatening. But remember that they, uh, there's no venom or anything in those pinchers. The, now, the really big earwigs can give you a little, a little pinch with those Cersei, but in, in essence, they're, they're pretty harmless. Many of the earwigs do have repugnatory glands, so if you happen to pick one up and squeeze it uh, and, and smell your hand, it, it can release a very foul-smelling odor. Uh, but again, a little soap and water will get that off of your hands and, and not be any problem. The biggest problem with earwigs, of course, is, is that uh, they often enter the home in the summertime. Uh, normally, they're, they're feeding outside on other small insects. Uh, they occasionally nibble on flower petals and things like that to get moisture. But when it starts to get hot and dry, they try to seek out places where they can hide out uh, in uh, little cracks and crevices. And of course, uh, the, the worst thing that can happen is that if you've got a door seal that's got just a little, uh, like a, a tenth of an inch uh, crack around it, you can get maybe a half a dozen of these that will get in there to hide. And guess what happens when you open the door? They drop down on you. And, and of course, people freak out uh, from that. We've also talked about the silverfish and fire brats, and, and this is the case where 
Remember that uh, most of the fire brats are feeding on molds and mildews. Most of the true silverfish are feeding on starches. And, and I'm seeing a resurgence now of uh, people using more and more wallpaper. But uh, unlike the old wallpapers that we put up with starch-based paste, uh, most people are, are now using a synthetic glue to put their wallpapers up and, and so uh, the synthetic glues that you use in wallpapers would not be usable by the true silverfish. Again, uh, we're seeing a, a few of these uh, coming in, especially in uh, 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 shake roofs. Now, does everybody know what a shake roof is? That's the, the wood that people, uh, you know, you see them in some of these higher priced neighborhoods. You'll see what uh, looks like layers of, of wood uh, up there. The problem with that wood, even though it may be treated, is that it tends to hold a lot of moisture uh, and, and develops molds and mildews in there. And we're seeing uh, uh, a couple of the species of silverfish that feed on molds and mildews uh, getting into those. And that's primarily the striped silverfish and the spotted silverfish uh, that, that will get into those. And so sometimes I have to deal with these in, in some fairly expensive homes uh, that people thought that they were, they were uh, doing the right thing. One of our final ones here are uh, a bunch of little nuisance pests, and, and I'm getting more and more of these coming in. I think with our extremely tightly sealed buildings, uh, we're tending to get more molds and mildews uh, and, and moisture problems in, in our overly sealed uh, buildings. Uh, these are little tiny uh, uh, insects. They're in the order Socoptera, so they're in their own order. And the reason why they're called book lice is, number one, they, they kind of look like little lice. They're also extremely flat, and, and being flat enough that they can actually fit between the pages of a book. That's pretty skinny. Uh, and, and I could probably take you over to the library. Uh, I know a couple of sections of the library where they've got some really old books that haven't been opened up in quite a while. And, and if we look through them, we can probably find some of the, the book lice uh, in there. But uh, we're seeing uh, uh, these uh, again, uh, especially where there's houses where they're using uh, uh, some wallpaper or some sort of wall coverings. Uh, these things can get behind there where there might be some moisture, molds, and mildews growing in there. Uh, there's another one that's kind of an interesting one that I'll, I'll just mention as a curiosity. I, I don't see it very commonly, except uh, I do find it here at the university in some of our older buildings, and that's what's called the Death Watch Sausage. The Death Watch Sausage is, uh, as you can see, looks pretty much look like the book lice, but it's a lot fatter, and, and, uh, and, and so it's a, got a more rounded body. But the reason why this is called the Death Watch Sosid is that this one also feeds primarily on molds and mildews, but it has an interesting habit of communicating with each other by tapping its abdomen on the surfaces. And, and what it really loves is a piece of loose wallpaper. It will get underneath the loose wallpaper and, and it will just basically uh, take its abdomen and you'll hear in a you know, very quiet stunning, you'll hear this. You'll just hear this little tapping noise. And you go, what in the world is that? Now, I had an infestation of these. I had an old Victorian home uh, when I was back in Pennsylvania as a faculty member there. Uh, and, and I remember uh, studying in the basement one night, and that happened to me. I got this little tapping, and I go, what is that? And I finally found a piece of paper. It wasn't actually wallpaper. It was a piece of cardboard that was leaning up against the wall and gotten a little moldy. And when I pulled it back, there were a bunch of these on the underside of it. Uh, Historically, uh, does anybody know Edgar Allan Poe and the Telltale Heart on you know, the, the tap, tap, tapping? Uh, we actually believe that uh, what he was, was talking about was, was this, uh, tapping on, on paper at that time. When it comes to the sausages, it's pretty easy. Uh, this one, if you can get dehumidifiers, uh, if you can get the humidity down to about 50 to 60 percent and maintain it that way, uh, book lice just really can't uh, uh, stand that very well. And also remove anything, uh, paper goods or cardboard goods that might be getting moist or moldy. Uh, 